So as a psychologist, I think I sometimes take for granted how much people value or don't value talking about their emotions. I spend most of my time thinking about my emotions, the emotions of my clients. I've spent years and years and years of training talking about emotions. They are really important to me. And so I know it's important, um, but I realized that in recent history, it was even debated whether emotions had any value at all. And of course, many folks who come to work with me haven't spent a lot of time thinking about their emotions. And so guess what? We start doing that in the work that we do together because thinking about our emotions, being in touch with them, being able to name them, the research is really clear. Knowing how we're feeling really specifically and why we're feeling that way is really important. So we're gonna talk about that today. Emotions, emotional intelligence, and some skills that we can use to improve our emotional intelligence. I'm Dr. Kit Slyes. I'm a life coach and licensed psychologist here to inspire perfectionists and anxious achievers to feel calm and confident while holding clear boundaries. And whether you are an anxious achiever or a perfectionist or not, this topic today is really relevant. We are talking about emotions. And I mentioned that being able to name your emotions really specifically and the context is important. And that is something called emotional granularity. That basically means that we can be really specific with how we're feeling and we can clearly articulate what is contributing to that feeling. So for example, if you were to say that you were upset, well, upset that could mean a lot of different things. What do you really mean by upset? Are you angry? Are you feeling disrespected? Are you feeling enraged? Or maybe you're feeling dread or fear or something along those lines, right? So really being able to drill down and name a more specific emotional experience is important. And so once you have that granularity piece, it's also important that you can say, well, why is that? It's like, oh, I had this upsetting experience. I was just, you know, out running errands and just kind of had a an interaction with somebody that just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And then I came home and the house was a mess. And it's sort of just all these things kind of mounting up. It wasn't just one thing that got me feeling this way. Or maybe it was one thing. Maybe it was like, okay, I heard my partner, my partner say this one thing to me and boy, oh boy, did that make my blood boil. And now, yeah, I feel enraged and attacked, right? So that's what we're talking about there. So when folks score higher on levels of emotional intelligence, which when we're talking about emotional intelligence, it's being able to recognize emotions in ourselves and in other people and being able to, to cope effectively. So folks who can do that when they have high emotional intelligence and especially when they have the high emotional granularity, basically they are able to cope more adaptively. Okay, so in other words, they're not going to run into self-harm behaviors or not even just self-harm, but like things that we do that aren't the best for us when we're trying to cope. You could be like reaching for the box of cookies rather than sitting down with our partner and having a meaningful discussion, right? So that's one thing that we see in folks who have these higher levels. Um, but the other thing is that we just see lower levels of mental health disorders like depression and anxiety and being able to be more productive in the workplace, have healthier, more satisfying relationships. So there's a lot of evidence of the real life impact of that. And the neuroscience on this is really cool. I think it's really fascinating that when folks are able to name their emotions objectively, and when I say objectively, they're naming their emotions and they're not then going on and, and judging themselves for having an emotion. What we see is that the centers of um, the center of our brain, the part of our brain, namely the amygdala, that is really uh, correlated with the quote unquote negative emotions. I don't like calling them negative. I like maybe difficult is a better term because they're not, they're useful. Emotions are useful. Um, they serve a purpose. We're going to talk about that as well. 
But for folks who are able to name being sad or angry, upset or enraged or dread or fear or whatever, when they can name it objectively, the part of the brain, the amygdala, that is largely responsible for or correlated with that feeling, okay, that part of the brain quiets down and it starts to communicate with our prefrontal cortex through another part of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex. Um, don't worry about that part, but the prefrontal cortex really comes online. And if you think about it, the prefrontal cortex, this is where, this is the thinking, planning, rational part of our brain where we can actually think through a situation and plan and make meaning. So what's happening is that the emotion, it's not that the emotion isn't important. We, just, we're not, we don't want to like shut it down, but we want to say, oh, what does this mean? We want to think about it also rationally. Like, what does it mean that I'm angry that this thing happened? Is this telling me that my value is being violated and maybe I need to say something about this or do something about it? Like, that's important information. But if we go into the emotion and we are objective about it and we feel overtaken by it, overwhelmed by it, all we're doing is feeling the anger and then acting impulsively, maybe in ways that aren't aligned with our values. Or alternatively, with the other thing that we see is that folks say, nope, I'm not angry. I'm going to, I'm going to stuff that ooh, in the closest closet door of anger and sadness and fear and just really try to cram it shut. Nope, not happening. Don't feel it. But what we see in their brain is their amygdalas are lighting up on fire, even if they're reporting that they don't, um, feel those feelings. And then later on, it's coming out in ways that they're not a aware of, usually in sort of like a passive aggressive or sometimes even in an aggressive manner, right? So um, so you could see how emotions, talking about them, being aware of our own emotions and others' emotions is important. I remember when, um, before I went to grad school to become a psychologist and I was just kind of dipping my feet in psychology courses, I started to learn about emotions. I had a whole course on emotions because they are so complex to even define them and what they are and where they come from and what does it all mean. And um, I remember learning about sort of the, de the debate of like the appraisal factor of like, where does that really come in to an emotion? Or do we need to appraise a situation in order to have an emotion? And I remember learning about how the physiological indicators of fear or anxiety are basically identical to the physiological indicators of excitement, right? So like, think about it, rapid heart rate, shallow breathing, maybe like sweaty palms, um, some maybe dilation of the pupils and okay, all those things you experience when you are, you know, up high uh, in a high building or on a mountain looking down and thinking, oh my goodness, I'm way up here. And it's also there when you are feeling excited, when you are, um, you just learned that you got a new job or you're on a, a new date with somebody that you're really digging. Okay. You're having the same physiological indicators in those very different experiences. And what the difference is, on top of a, a cliff or a high building, you are thinking, oh shoot, that would be bad if I fell. When you are learning that you just got this like dream job, you are thinking, oh my goodness, this is going to be amazing. And so for me, as somebody who was quite anxious at that time in my life, my early twenties, right? I was I was like, wow, great. This will basically, I can like solve my anxiety. I just need to think differently about the situation. But it turned out that wasn't the whole story. <laughs> I mean, it helps. The appraisal is important. It's an important part of our emotions. And you certainly can tell your brain a different story about something. But it turns out that our nervous systems, there might, well, one thing is there might, it might be um, a biological predisposition to just physiologically go to a more place of those um, anxiety, physical symptoms more, or you might have learned in your family to do that as well. But our nervous systems also get primed from our experiences in life. 
And so if we had a lot of experiences in childhood that were unsafe or scary or anxiety provoking, our nervous systems basically get primed to appraise situations um, differently. And this all comes from a place of protection. If we had a lot of unsafe situations, our nervous system is telling us a story about how, oh, your heart rate is getting up a little bit. It probably means something's unsafe, even if the thing that's causing your heart rate to go up is a good thing. So the other thing that is impacting this is that we also learn adaptive and maladaptive ways of coping based on a particular set of sensations. So those stories that we're, our nervous system is priming us for, we begin to rehearse those and they're often untrue. And we're rehearsing those stories and telling them quickly, just again, based on those physiological indicators or something, something that feels like something in the environment that could be unrelated to where that story is coming from in a past environment. So stories, these are stories like, um, the story could be the world is not a safe place for me. It could be stories like nothing ever goes right for me. It could be stories like I don't have a lot of power in this world. It could be stories like I'm never going to be good enough. None of those things are true all of the time. They might be true some of the time. Sure. You might find yourself in unsafe positions. You might not do as well as you want to at some times. You might things don't always go right, but they're not always true, right? So we're looking at all these different pieces when it comes to saying, do you have the ability to recognize your own emotions and name them? And are you emotionally intelligent in being able to cope with that and also sense emotions from others and respond accordingly as well? So emotional intelligence comes from our genetics, it in, it's informed by our environment to a degree, and it's also a skill that we can cultivate. So let's find out a little bit as you're watching, I'm sure you're wondering, are you emotionally intelligent? Um, so there are a lot of um, scales and tests out there that can look at this. I'm looking at one from the Meyer Salavoy Caruso Emotional Intelligence test and I'm looking at a couple of different domains that they look at. They look at four different branches. So one branch they're looking at is perceiving emotions. And this is looking at can you perceive the emotion in yourself or others as well as in you know art or movies or other things where there's an emotion present. So this would look like can you express your emotion clearly can you validate another person's emotion? Do you know what they are feeling and say, yeah, I can see that you're feeling or, or I can sense maybe that you're feeling this. That's what perceiving emotions is. Then we have this branch of facilitating thought, which is basically using um, and feeling emotions that are necessary to um, go through some cognitive process. So in other words, you might look at an emotional experience from the past and rather just dwell on, wow, that sucked and blah, you're going to say, okay, well, did, what can I learn from that? Or you, you are able to use emotions in decision making. So you might think, okay, if I make this decision, how am I going to feel if that happens? That is important. Yes, you might also be taking in consideration other factors, but your feelings are important too. Another domain that they look at is understanding emotion. So we're talking about emotional information, um, understand how emotions combine and um, play into relationship patterns and to appreciate the emotional meaning behind those relationship patterns or whatever is coming up. So for example, can you um, handle rejection with grace and be willing to talk about it if the person is open to it rather than just reacting, understanding that, hey, they've got an emotional experience as well. And that's an important part of the dialogue. And that just because I'm having an emotional experience to my re rejection doesn't mean that I'm going to discard maybe this important dialogue that's here. Our emotions are both important, going to come together and try to understand. Okay. Okay. 
And then the last piece of their, um, this particular conceptualization of emotional intelligence is managing emotions. So this is being open to feelings. Remember that closet I was talking about earlier? It's not stuffing them in the closet, okay? And it's being able to not be taken over by your emotion to feel it, to observe it, and to use it for understanding and growth. So for example, if you are good at managing emotions, you're going to behave rationally when you're feeling angry, even though your anger is valid. So whether or not you resonate with those factors of emotional intelligence, you can learn emotional intelligence. Um, so one way you're going to start is just by naming your emotions. Go ahead and Google feelings wheel. There's a million of them out there and it's got all these great um, diagrams of get, being able to get, helping you get really granular with your emotions. When we are naming our emotions, we don't want to say, I am the emotion. We want to say, I'm feeling the emotion or I'm noticing that I'm feeling the emotion. And the reason for this has to go back to that brain size I was talking about. You know, there is mixed research on folks naming their emotions that sometimes it does make the emotion bigger and harder to respond to. And what it does seem to be is how much we can kind of separate ourselves from the emotion. Um, it's important to acknowledge it, but not become the emotion. So if I say I, I'm angry, then I, I am the anger versus, oh, I'm noticing that I'm feeling angry. It allows me to almost like self-validate the emotion and to acknowledge it within myself, but I'm not becoming the anger. I'm then able to use my emotional intelligence skills of rationally thinking about the anger. And what does this mean to me? And what do I want to do with it? So that, if that's all you take away from today, I think that's beautiful. Um, but beyond that, you can also build more awareness about how emotions are coming up for you with more of those mindfulness skills, which is the objective observer, observing the emotion in yourself. What does it feel like physically in your body? When do you feel it? Are you able to communicate it with other people or do you keep it inside? And the goal here is not to judge yourself for these things. We're just observing them. That observation alone oftentimes creates change that you are not even planning for or expecting. So if you want to do a full stop right there, you could probably do a lot of work of just this observation, this mindful, gentle, non-judgmental, kind observer, right? And that leads to another technique which is um, the self-compassion, which I talk about a lot in my videos, um, self-compassion, being kind to oneself um, in your emotional reaction and also in the way that you're talking to yourself. Are you creating other unhelpful emotions just because of that self-talk that you're using? And then we can look at also other coping techniques, breathing, Belly breathing, diaphragmatic breathing, square breathing. These are all beautiful, nostril breathing. These are all beautiful techniques that really um, get to the heart of our nervous system and helps calm the emotional experience. I know people always like breathing like I'm breathing all the time, but it's like, no, there's real data and science about how breathing um, relates to our nervous system, which remember our nervous system is setting us up with all these stories that we're telling that aren't necessarily true based on all these past experiences. So our nervous system is really central to the emotions that we're experiencing and breathing targets our nervous system directly. Um, what else? When you are doing this emotional work, it's also important that you have this willingness to be vulnerable and to see blind spots and parts of yourself that might be painful and difficult to look at. That's where therapy can be helpful, but also sometimes hard. The point is that this work is hard. Cultivating our emotional intelligence, our emotional awareness, it's not easy, folks. I hate to break it to you. So having that willingness to get feedback from others, to engage with dialogue with others, that social interaction is important in cultivating our emotional awareness. And then be aware of any stories that you're telling yourself in your brain. <laughs> What are those stories? How do your past experiences, um, how might they be skewing the stories? Can you tell yourself a story that's a little bit more true to help regulate your emotion and be aware of your emotions in the moment? 
So I will um, link to some playlists that I have that might be helpful, the um, cultivating calm and some things on self-compassion. Um, but I hope that you found this video today helpful and I will see you next time. Bye for now.